Right. So we have, uh, what are we on now, Ray? We're on 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. We're on, we're on session 15 of 24. Um, not quite the home stretch, but we're, we're getting there. Uh, today we're going to, well not today, I keep saying today, but this session we're going to be talking about troubleshooting and debugging production applications in Kubernetes, uh, aka the failing demo talk. This is going to be good. Um, uh, unfortunately, Barak couldn't be with us today, uh, but uh, we have we have Ray Sang here, uh, and Ray is well worth the money. So so uh, you're you're going to you're going to be in luck getting a great uh, session here. The sponsor of this session is Aspos. Um, actually a sponsor of uh, both virtual jug sessions so we appreciate their uh, their sponsorship and their support and uh, participating hopefully uh, shortly will be go java go java they're actually a brazilian java user group so hopefully they'll be on um, shortly so what do aspos do i'm sure many of you probably haven't heard of aspos but uh, aspos provide file format components and controls so apis uh, which will allow you to connect into into uh, many different applications, uh, so that users can work with uh, with uh, common documents. So, uh, if you ever need to do anything like that, then certainly do visit Aspos www.aspos.com. Um, and like I say, you know they 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 support the community heavily, and it's 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 uh, companies just like Aspos that make uh, things like the VJug24 and the Virtual Jug uh, possible. So, so a big thank you to to their support. Um, talking about making the VJ possible, we have Zero Turnaround, of course, who uh, are the company that uh, sponsor the virtual jug, and uh, without which support, literally none, none of this would be possible. So a massive thank you to Zero Turnaround. And if you want to develop at warp speed, uh, then then you should use everything that Ray suggests, as well as Zero Turnaround's tool. So make sure you go to zeroturnaround.com and check out some of the free trials that uh, that you have there for things like JRebel. And Excel. Um, so, how can you interact with Ray? Well, if you jump on Slack, uh, you can uh, go to the live session channel and ask all your questions there. You can also tweet with uh, hashtag vjo24, and make sure you do increase your video quality so that you get the best experience uh, with the highest resolution. Just click the settings cog on your on your video, and you can crank that up to the highest you can you can get. Um, the Slack group, if you go to vjug24.com or virtualjug.com, uh, there'll be a link there to, uh, with, a, with an invite uh, as to how you can join that. Just click the Slack uh, image. OK, so that's enough waffling on. Let me pass over to, ah, oh, we have a jug here. Do we? Oh, no, it's, uh, yes. Hello, Go Java. Can you hear me, Go Java? Hi, Simon. Sure, hey. I can hear you. Awesome. So whereabouts, whereabouts are you located in Brazil? Uh, can you still hear me? Can I hear you now? <laughs> you can't hear me now. OK. Where, whereabouts are you located in Brazil? We're you're based in Goiânia. OK. Uh, uh, Three three hundred kilometers from our capital, Brasilia. Okay, that was my next question because unfortunately my uh, my geography is not too great. Okay, well, welcome to the virtual jug. We'll be passing by uh, later for, to ask any questions or anything like that. So uh, sit back and enjoy the session. Um, so with that, uh, did, I can't I can't stop saying. Did anyone say? Did someone say Kubernetes? And I see you, Ray. I'm sorry, but uh, over over to you, Ray, in your own time. All righty. Well, thanks, Simon. <laughs> and you definitely said Kubernetes. Uh, <laughs> and that's why I'm here. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and uh, start the, uh, the presentation. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Can you all see the screen? We certainly can. I certainly hope so. All right. Well, uh, thanks again uh, for VDRUG uh, to host this at VDRUG24. I uh, really appreciate uh, to having me here as well. And um, here we go. My name is Ray. I'm a developer advocate for the Google Cloud Platform. What that means is I'm part of the engineering group here at Google Cloud, and um, I do two things. Uh, number one is I try to bring some of the latest and greatest technology that Google has to offer to developers all over the world. Uh, and I also like to hear about uh, the feedback, the, the usages you know, of our technology as well. And um, I would love to hear 
uh, about your thoughts and your feedback, your comments, uh, the best way to reach out to me is uh, on Twitter, at Satanism. So please, please reach out. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, the session was uh, going to have a co-speaker. Unfortunately, Baruch uh, is unable to make it today. But uh, I do want to mention that the, uh, the session probably would have been a lot better when he's around. So I'm sorry that uh, he's not able to join today. So uh, enough about the intro. Let's jump straight into the content. Uh, and today, I'm going to show you a uh, microservices application that I already developed uh, before. And uh, I'm not here to talk about the reasons of using microservices or whether you should be using microservices or not, uh, but that uh, if you do use it, and if you happen to be running it in Kubernetes, which is a great uh, platform to be running it in, uh, here are some of the, the tips and tricks that I got um, that I can share with everyone. And um, to demonstrate you know, the application and the capabilities, I built this simple application. It's a guest book. It's uh, one of the best looking application I can ever write uh, because I'm not a front end developer, as you can see, it's just black and white. And uh, you can simply, you know, enter the name and message and it's gonna say hello to you. And uh, we're going to record this in a guest book in a database. And uh, this is actually using multiple microservices behind the scenes. And obviously, probably not the best example of microservices, but it actually you know, is simple enough uh, and also sophisticated enough to communicate some of the common issues that uh, you may be running into. So when you click on a button, it's going to communicate with the, the backend services. And here's the high-level architectural uh, diagram uh, behind the scenes. So the UI uh, issues the, the greeting uh, call to Hello World service that says the Hello Back. And then uh, there's a whole uh, CRUD uh, RESTful service uh, that stores the messages, and that's going to store the data in uh, MySQL. Okay, and um, we also are using uh, Redis for session replication. All right, so let's just take a look at this app and see how that's being deployed and uh, see if everything works. So I'm going to go to my little visualization tool here. This is actually a Kubernetes cluster I have running. Uh, I can see that uh, we have five nodes. So this is a Kubernetes cluster with five different virtual machines. This is actually running on Google Cloud Platform in Google Container Engine. Uh, all I needed to do was click a button and say I need five nodes, and here comes the cluster. And I already deployed my application into it. And the way that these applications are deployed is basically uh, through a series of uh, these uh, YAML file or the YAML file definitions. And these are uh, basically describing like what container images I want to run, and how many instances do I need, and how do I expose them as a service, and such and such. Uh, you can learn more about Kubernetes uh, in detail uh, in some of the videos I have online as well. But, uh, but here is the application that's deployed. And Kubernetes distributed uh, the deployment across the, the many different nodes that I have in the cluster. Uh, so for example, on the top here, I have two Hello World UI instance. This is the front end. And they happen to be talking to the guestbook service. And I got two instances here as well. And I have MySQL deployed also, uh, and, and so on and so forth. Okay, And the, the box is in green. These are called the services. So these are the low balancing uh, first class citizens in Kubernetes. So every one of these service IP address. And some of these services, I explicitly set it to be uh, external uh, load balanced so that in addition to an internal IP, we also have an external IP. So I can click on this external IP and I should be able to see the page. Huh. Let me, let me try that again. Click on the IP. Oh, where did it go? And okay. Well, that is, uh, that is a problem here. Uh, this demo is not apparently working. You're, and, living up, you're living up to the title, but, to be fair. <laughs> Baruch, Baruch is not here to help me troubleshoot it. He usually has a video of the backup, but uh, he's not here. So uh, that is too bad. I guess we'll have to figure out what's wrong and um, somehow make it work. So let's see what we got here. Uh, white label error message. That's pretty bad because I didn't have a better looking error page. And this is probably one of the worst uh, error you can get. It's a combination of internal server error with a status of 500, also a 404, and a null. Uh, I, so it could be a null pointer. It could be a 500. It could be a 400, uh, 404. At this moment, I have no idea uh, why this is the case. And it doesn't seem to be going away. So 
there are limited options in terms of what we can do to uh, troubleshoot this. And I've been in the industry for a long time, uh, almost 15 years now, and uh, I had my share of uh, doing production support and uh, getting caught up for production issues like this at 3 a.m. in the morning. And there are a few things that I do first. Uh, usually I ask the audience what you like to do first, but here I get to choose. Uh, maybe, well, let me see Let me see what is going on here. So usually, usually I would probably check another environment like staging, right? So, uh, so this is my production environment, and uh, these are all the instances I have running right now, and they all seem to be healthy because I got health check in Kubernetes, and they're obviously running. Uh, but let me see uh, about the staging environment. In Kubernetes, we have the concept of NAN spaces. Uh, what that means is uh, in the same cluster of the five machines that I have, or however machines that you have in your cluster, I can actually carve it up into these virtual uh, grouping, virtual units. Uh, these are called NAN spaces. And within the same NAN space, I can, or within different NAN spaces, I can actually deploy uh, the same application. So what I have done here, is to deploy the same application in the staging namespace already. And I should be able to see get pods. And I have my staging environment running at this very moment. And I should be able to uh, figure out if I have the same issue in staging, right? It's probably the first thing that we do is to check different environment. Does other environment work or is it just production? So I'm going to go to this staging environment. I have a new endpoint here. I'm just going to go ahead and run it. and. Oh, I'm going to say hello. I'm going to pretend to be Simon here and say hello. And that definitely worked. And But for my production, definitely not the case. So then I probably need to check, well, hold on a second. Are they actually running exactly the same application? Maybe it was the deployment issue. Maybe the wrong version got into production. Um, so let's, let's, we have to check it. How do we do that? Well, usually what you would have is a um, the YAML file that you use to deploy your application into your production environment, into your staging, and everything else. Uh, and typically, in the deployment file, let me see the UI deployment, we will be able to specify the image. So this will be the container image I am going to deploy. Now, unfortunately, uh, I made a big mistake here. Uh, I'm using the latest version of Hollow World UI. But in Docker and in Docker Content tags or image tags, latest could mean anything. Uh, you know, even though we're doing continuous integration and continuous delivery, uh, it doesn't mean we always deploy the latest uh, tag to production environment. In fact, what does latest mean? Your latest tag on your machine could be very different from my latest tag on my machine because we pulled uh, this image at different times. So this is a little troublesome, OK? But luckily, what we can do is we can uh, say kubectl. Uh, let's see, get the pods. So we can actually see the running instances. And here's a little trick. We can do a kubectl describe one of these application instances. And if you scroll up a little bit more, you're going to see all of the, say, com uh, environmental configuration, all of the settings that we applied. And we should also be able to see the image that's been deployed, and latest is not exactly useful, right? But we can also see the image ID, and that will give us a hash that's unique to this particular uh, image that we're running. So this hash ends with 6473E. Uh, what we can do is to do very similar things. We can do a get pod, but only in the staging environment, right? And then we can also do a kubectl. Uh, in the staging environment, let's uh, do a describe pod, and we can just double check the hash to make sure that this is, in fact, the same application that's running. And if I scroll up a little bit more, let me see here, image, and 6473E. Uh, hmm. So at this moment, we are pretty certain that the application is the same because the, the Docker image hash is exactly the same. But I have no idea where this came from because the tag is latest. Uh, again, this is not the best practice. You should always tag it with the version of the app or with a, with a Git hash of some sort so you can uniquely identify uh, this particular uh, application image. But since we don't have it, uh, luckily, we actually have this image uh, stored in Artifactory. Uh, what that means is 
I can go to Baruch's artifact tree instance right now. Uh, I do need to log in here. So uh, bear with me. I start logging, magically put in the password. Uh, I can actually do a search. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit. And I can check. I can put the SHA into the checksum. And I'll count the container uh, that actually matches the hash. And you can actually see very clearly here that the latest version is actually uh, version number 50. Okay, So we can actually go into this version, for example. And uh, we can see uh, even more properties. Uh, let me see here. We can actually see the manifest of what actually went in. So we can examine, for example, uh, the Docker uh, manifest here, or the repository name, the manifest type. Uh, manifest type. Um, and I think uh, down here we have builds, for example. So because this image came from a uh, Jenkins server doing CI CD, uh, it actually links directly to the Jenkins job that built this application, which is really, really handy. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have the Jenkins server up and running at this moment. But if I did, I can click on this link, and it will take me to the pipeline that produced everything. Um, and I can kind of figure out where this actually came from. Okay, Now, I'm not an um, uh, expert in this uh, artifactory, unfortunately, because uh, Baruch's not here. But what I do know is uh, there are things I can drill into uh, where I can actually potentially find uh, what actually went into uh, this particular image. So here I can see that, um, hmm. Now, I don't know who Mark is, but that's not Baruch and that's not me. But uh, somebody pushed this image, right? And so I can know who actually did the, you know, created this image in the first place. Uh, and we should be able to see uh, a few other things in here. Um, if we you know, look into it, we can see how this was built. Uh, we can see the environment of variables. We can see the modules that we uh, were associated with this image. And here we can actually see exactly which particular jar file that we're using as well. And this kind of gives you the traceability into what actually went into this image in case you do need to go back and figure out what is wrong with your application. Okay. Now, assuming that this is all checked out, this was an uh, application that was tested and approved. This is a container image that was built properly uh, by the person that we know. Uh, and authorized to deploy, of course, and but we're having this issue. Now, we got rid of the inconsistency between environment. We got rid of the potential uh, suspect of deploying the wrong version of the app. We established the fact that latest was not useful, but we were able to figure out exactly what version went in. Now what? Well, typically, we will go into the logs. We'll probably go into the logs and uh, see uh, what other details, uh, detailed error messages we may, we may actually have. So in Kubernetes, this is actually pretty convenient. We can get the instance, of course, and um, we can actually uh, get one of these instances, right? And we can just do kubectl logs, that you have, and we can actually follow the logs. So anything in the container that you output as a uh, standard out or a standard error is going to be captured uh, through the Docker streams uh, and forwarded to Kubernetes. And Kubernetes can just read the stream directly from this one command line. You don't actually have to figure out which machine is running this process. Uh, Kubernetes already knows this, and you can figure it out for you. All you need to do is to figure out, well, which instance do you want to see the logs? Now, we have an issue here because uh, we have like two instances here. right? So the probability of me uh, finding the instance that has an arrow is about 50-50, right? So if I do this, uh, I'm pretty lucky today. Um, I actually see the arrow. And uh, if I scroll up a little bit, uh, I hopefully can see the root cause of this. And this is quite a lot. I, I don't know where to start, actually. Ah, there we go. So here we have a HTTP client error exception, uh, receive for for null. Um, OK, well, not, not so useful. I still don't, I'm not still uh, quite sure where the issue is. We know this may be happening on a certain line of code, but it doesn't necessarily help me uh, because the error message is not good enough. It doesn't necessarily help me um, figure out what's wrong. Now, we all know that potentially we don't run just one or two instances in production, right? So what if we actually have uh, multiple instances? So if we have more than just two, right? And let's go up to, say, five, 
now the probability of you finding the right logs uh, just decreased, right? Now you have uh, one in five chances to actually hit the instance that actually has the right logs. Uh, the more instances you have, the less likely you're going to find the right one the first time, unless it's the, the, the problem is very prevalent and is happening in every single request. Uh, then you have a much, much bigger problem as well. Right? But there's actually a little utility uh, that, I, uh, that one of the audience in my past talk told me, and the utility is called Stern. And with Stern, you can actually just specify the name of the app or the deployment. In this case, it's called Hello World UI. And it can automatically figure out all of the running instances behind the scenes. So whether you have six or you have 10, it's going to be able to aggregate uh, all the logs together into the same console. This is actually quite useful. Uh, this is probably the first time I showed this in a talk because uh, I, I didn't know about this utility before. What that means is if I go back here and do a refresh, let me uh, do the refresh here. Um, oh, maybe that's not the best way to show it. But if I do a refresh a few times, uh, you can see that new logs actually came through uh, from different servers. Right? So if you need to proactively just tell the, the logs from all of the potential instances that has an issue, uh, this is a really, really good utility to use as code stern. Okay? Now, of course, when you have so many issues flying by, uh, it's really hard to isolate exactly what the, the problem is. Now, in most of the Kubernetes deployments, there are ways for you to aggregate the logs together and store them in a centralized logging. Uh, potentially, uh, for an on-prem deployment, for example, you may be able to deploy a Elk stack. You can deploy, uh, basically, Elasticsearch, uh, Logstash in Kibana, and uh, then you can get aggregate logging uh, directly in Kubernetes. What that means is everything that you output to standard out and standard arrow will be forwarded to centralized logger. Right? And from there, you can just you know, do your searches, and you can potentially analyze the log a lot better. Uh, on Google Cloud, because we ran this uh, application on Google uh, Cloud Platform, uh, what that means is we actually came with a, a centralized logging uh, tool already, and it's called Stack Driver Trace. And if you provision a Kubernetes cluster on Google Cloud Platform, this is provided to you automatically. Okay? What that means is I can go ahead and, uh, you know, I don't know if you can see it, but down here I can pick and choose. I want to see the logs for my uh, GKE cluster. That's our container engine cluster. And I can choose the cluster I'm actually using. I got two clusters. I need to see the one I'm using for the demo. And then I want to see the environment, which is in default. That's my production environment. And here you can actually see all the arrows that's happening. And you can click into one of them, and you can actually just see all the details. This is a lot easier if you need to go back and kind of read the logs or without so much interruptions with other things streaming by. Uh, in fact, you can also do a search if you want. So I can search for exception, and that will show me all of the log messages that has exception in there. Uh, this is also quite useful. Again, this error message is not entirely useful by itself. Uh, but here's the thing that I like to do. Um, also, which is to kind of figure out whether this arrow is uh, prevalent to all of the instances, all of the, the servers that I have, or is it just uniquely uh, isolated to one of the instances, right? Because it could happen. Sometimes there's just one bad instance, and um, what people typically do uh, to fix it uh, quickly is uh, to just kill it and restarting it. And that's very easily done in Kubernetes. Uh, but uh, I don't recommend it. Uh, that's what you do, especially if you want to figure out what actually went wrong. Because if you kill the instance that's bad, then there is a possibility that the same issue come back a week later, and you still don't know what's wrong, and you kill it again. And you're just going to have this recurring problem. This will be a valid question to ask. Now, in the logger, uh, we can also potentially export the log into different services that we have. For example, we can stream this log to a messaging service that we have called PopSub. What that means is uh, you can actually write an application that monitors the, the log stream. And you can potentially build real-time analysis and real-time metrics directly from the streaming log messages. You can also store the logs in long-term storage, in cloud storage. But my favorite is actually exporting it to BigQuery. And what is BigQuery? Well, BigQuery is a tool that we use um, that we can query uh, massive amount of data. 
Uh, in my demo of BigQuery, we typically query uh, data sizes up to a terabyte, for example. And we can do a query on ter terabyte uh, you know, in, within seconds without any indices. So in this case, what I can do is I can go to BigQuery, and I can already see that uh, we have all the applications that ever ran. And on the left here, I have a little Hello World UI application. Uh, so every day, this exports the um, well, it exports the, the log in near real time, but it's also bucketed into a daily uh, table, right? So I can actually query my logs uh, in a structured way. What that means is here I have written a little uh, SQL query. So I'm querying my log with SQL query. Uh, I'm going to count the occurrences of uh, basically um, uh, all of the errors that happened in uh, all of the days that I'm in recording logs. Uh, that's from a container of the name Hello World UI. That contains exception. I'm going to group by the name of the pod to see, or the instance of the application name, uh, to see if they came from one instance or multiple instances. And I'm going to order by occurrences, so I'm going to see if the you know there's one instance that has the most. And I can just run this query, and it's going to query my log, and uh, this should give me a result back. And in this case, it may appear that this is pretty uh, evenly distributed, right? But there's a chance that maybe one of the instances is just having a lot of issue, and you can go back and troubleshoot it. Now, because uh, I'm querying the log from everything, what I can do also do is to query the log just from today. So let's see from today if this is still the case. Oh, interesting. So from today, I got a few instances that has more issue than the other, right? So I can just um, you know potentially copy this name of the instance, and uh, let's go take a look. So. We can kill the log of this instance, hopefully. Uh, there we go. I, I do see a lot of arrows coming through. Um, I can see that this is an instance is running. It's BGBCZ. That's not one. It's been running for about two hours now. Um, then we have the choice. Uh, do I want to just kill it? And hopefully, this, uh, this issue doesn't come back. Or we can actually do better. In Kubernetes, what we can actually do is to isolate this application instance so that it's still running, but it's not being served to the, in, the consumer anymore, right? And the way that we do that is by using what Kubernetes calls a, a label. In Kubernetes, everything can be labeled. Uh, what that means is uh, for this deployment, I say git pod, and I can show the labels. Uh, for each of these things, we have a label, a key value pair. Uh, and I define these. We have a key code app and a key code serving. And so in the load balancer, in the service, what we are saying is, for the Hello World UI, I'm only serving the traffic not only to the label of app is equal to Hello World UI, but also that the flag serving has to be true. And the way that we do it is by, uh, in the service YAML, we can actually specify this selector. And here you can see that for this service to route traffic, uh, these two labels has to match. What that also means is I can actually update these labels uh, dynamically while this whole system is serving. What that means is I can use the Kubernetes command line. I can just um, use kubectl label, right? I can give it the name of the pod that I think is having the issue. I'm going to overwrite the label. And I'm going to set the serving status to false. And that's pretty much it. Now, if I go back to get pods, we can see that this flag is now false, right? But uh, it's still running. And it's still running, it's been running for two hours. But because we said in Kubernetes that we needed to have five instances of this application, when I took one of them out of service, it actually automatically restarted another one for me. So here we have a new instance that's being started to take over, basically, for the, the instance that just got removed from serving, which is pretty cool, right? Because all of these things are pretty much managed uh, automatically by Kubernetes. If I took another instance out, it's going to start another instance to take over, basically. Now I have isolated this instance. Then I can do a lot more in-depth troubleshooting. For example, in Kubernetes, I can get into the shell of this container. If you're using Docker, you can use Docker exec. When you use Kubernetes and multiple machines is running behind the scenes, 
uh, rather than SSH into that machine and do Docker exec, uh, what I can just do is do kubectl exec, and here I'm in the shell. And I can, um, I can do a PX, I can see my application is running. If I got my logs, I can go tail my logs in the file system, which I don't recommend you do. Uh, but in case you do have something in the file system, you can introspect it as well. Um, you can issue, for example, I think it's dash three uh, to force the uh, the JVM to dump the thread dump or whatever that may be. Uh, you can do a lot more things here, right? But um, you can also, for example, if you you have a JMX uh, uh, port that's opened, uh, you may be able to connect to that JMX port directly. And the way that we do it is by establishing a secure tunnel uh, from your local laptop directly into the container and connecting to a specific port. Uh, what that means is uh, we can actually do a uh, ooh, <laughs> port. Let me see here. Uh, pull forward. Yeah, there we go. So I can do a pull forward, uh, and then I can give it the name of the pod, right? So let me see here. The one that's not serving is this one. So I can do kubectl pull forward, the name of the instance. Uh, I think it's having issue. And then um, I can specify. The local port, like uh, 1990, for example, and want to forward it to the remote port in that container, uh, 8080. Okay. So, for example, if I want to see if this instance is actually having issue, uh, I can just establish a pull forward directly to that specific instance. And once I've done that, I can go to my local 1990 uh, and take a look. Huh? Interesting. That works. Okay. Hello, Simon. And so if you think that one of the instances is having an issue, you could definitely use this technique. But in this case, it doesn't seem like the issue is isolated to the instance itself. This is a proper instance. It works. So something else must be run. So what can I do? Well, there are choices now. We can either get rid of this instance because it's not serving anymore. We can just go ahead and delete it. Or if we really want to, we can kind of try to put it back into the service. And the way that we do it is by simply flipping the flag back to true. And if I do a get pod again, this is now running and now serving. But because we said we told Kubernetes we want to have five instances total, by putting one back into the, into the service, now we have six instances in total. So Kubernetes has to pick and choose an additional instance to remove. Uh, there's a heuristic in terms of how that's being done, but typically it tries to remove the instance that has the shortest age or the small, uh, the, the the shortest age basically, because it's most likely to be the newest instance and it's probably not warmed up yet. So it tries to keep the oldest uh, instances around, right? So in this case, it removes one of the instances by going through some kind of heuristic. Okay, well that's still not helping us out. Um, you know, we check the logs. Uh, we, we can troubleshoot the instance individually, and this obviously seems to be working. What else can we do? Well, maybe there's, because it is microservices, maybe there are some things that's happening behind the scenes in service-to-service -service communication that's just broken. Uh, we can actually do that, and you need to build in your application to have such a capability, and that's called distributed tracing. Okay? With distributed tracing, what you do is you pass a unique and uh, uh, basically a trace ID uh, throughout the request and downstream to all of the other microservices that you made the call from the initial request, right? So from a single request ID, you will be able to correlate all of the service calls that's made, being made from the original request. And I remember doing this uh, the first time that, you know, I, several, several years ago, the first time I had a, a service-oriented architecture implementation, uh, my first manager was like, hey, Ray, just remember, uh, if you, if we're making the calls to another SOA service, uh, make sure you propagate the request ID or trace ID downstream. I'm like, why do I need to do that? And he said, well, because we're in consulting, right? we have to make sure that when the system is slow, we can tell the customer which system is actually running slow. And that's what's very valid, right? Because you know, if without, without, even without blaming anyone, right, we need to determine where our bottlenecks are. If you have latency issue, if you have certain communication uh, breakages, you need to know where in the chain of the call is actually causing the problem. Uh, typically, people do this by using uh, Zipkin, and you add a tracer into your app. Then you forward the trace information to Zipkin. You can have a very nice view of the, the call stack. 
In uh, Google Cloud, we also have our own backend. It's called uh, StackDriver Trace. So you can actually forward the same Zipkin um, data to a Zipkin proxy, for example, that will subsequently be able to forward all of the trace data to StackDriver Trace. So this is what we can actually see in a traced system. So for example, on the top here, I can see that somebody made the call. Uh, that was me. I made a call to Hello Ray. Right, and I have API messages, and these are all the uh, external or across the network boundary calls that I made. Uh, and you can click into every one of them. And you can see in more detail of you know what happened here. Was well, somebody called the repository entity uh, controller, and this is the amount of time that it, it, it took. Right, so we can see a lot of information. We can also maybe find out are there any four uh, fours. So let's see. Oh, there are some four fours. So if I click into it, no, oh, this is nice. So I can see that the, this initial request that I made to the home page made the call to the hello service. And for some reason, uh, it returned the 404 status code. So this kind of helps me to figure out that where downstream in my service calls may potentially have caused the issue. OK, so I know for a fact now that the, the 404 message I got is probably coming from this one call. But why did this call took place in the, you know, in the first place? Why did somebody make this call? Well, for this, we really have to go back to the logs and understanding our application. But we saw the logs. The log was not useful. Then the question is, what do we do? Right? Typically, what people do is say they go back to their source code. They check out the version that was uh, deploy to production. They add a few log messages, hoping that everything will work uh, and help them troubleshoot the, the issue. They redeploy the application back into production and hope the same issue occurs again. And, and when that time comes, it, you go back to the log and you try to figure out what's wrong. Well, we can actually do better because that process is going to take potentially a long time. What we can do is that uh, for every one of these application instances that we're running, uh, it's actually running with a special Java agent. Uh, it's a debugger agent that uh, Google Cloud provides. Uh, you can run the debugger agent uh, even outside of Google Cloud, and you can do exactly the same thing, which is we can find the application in StackDriver debugger in this case. I can find this debugger. I can find this application. And because I'm using a git.property file, it also knows where I got my uh, source code from and which revision of the source code am I looking at. It automatically syncs to that specific revision of the source code. And I can find my application here um, in Hello World UI. I'm going to zoom in a little bit. And I'm going to go through the source code. And I'm going to show you uh, a few things that's pretty cool. So here's the controller that I have. And we can do two things. Well, number one is. We can add the logs. So here I'm going to go to log point. And don't you wish you can just add the log to a running application on the fly? Well, this is what we can do. We can say here, uh, we can just start typing the log. So we can say, uh, usually what we do is uh, one, I'm here, right? That's how we add our debugging message. And that very moment that I click on add, this log message that needs to be printed on this code path is automatically distributed to all of the running instance attached to this debugger. And that's quite magical. Uh, in addition to just simple message, I can also say the name is, and I can put in an expression. So I can actually introspect the, the variable, the values in the variable that's currently in scope. Okay, And uh, maybe I add another log, uh, three, I'm here. Uh, and then uh, let me just add another one for here again. OK? And again, these are applied directly to the application at the runtime. You don't have to do anything else. And if I go back to this app, if I do a few refresh, right, the code might have executed through this, these a few lines. Uh, what I can do is I can go back to the logger. Let me go back to logging. And uh, by the way, this is a live demo. And if everything's lucky, I should be able to find the log. Ah, here we go. Log point one. I'm here, right? And that's automatically inserted by the debugger agent. And log point two, the name is empty. 
So what that means is this is a user error. The user forgot to put the name in. Of course, that uh, caused issues, right? No, well, not really. But uh, knowing that is the case, now you can very clearly see what is wrong with your production system. And the debugger is something that we actually use in uh, Google internally as well. These are uh, pretty much the same debugger agent. Uh, and they add very, very minimal overhead to get this kind of capability. So we actually use the debugger agent in our production system. Uh, we can do even better. Uh, don't you wish sometimes you can just step through the code and capture a, uh, a code stack, just like you do with a real debugger? Right? But you cannot do that in a production environment, because if you attach a real debugger into your running process, what is going to happen is you're going to stop the user. The user is going to wait for a response until you step through all the code, until you're done with debugging. Now, that's not very useful. Uh, what we can do is to actually add what we call a snapshot. And with a snapshot, what we can do is um, we can add a snapshot, for example, here. And right now, we're listening to all of the instances uh, waiting for an instance to have you know, executed this line of code. And now that we know uh, this is a user error, what I'm going to do is to open up a new, a new window. Let me see here, a guest window here. And I'm going to paste this in, right? And as soon as that's done, uh, and let me see, Ray, hello. All right, so I'm executing through the code. And as you can see here, we actually captured a, co a code stack immediately. And I can see all the methods uh, of the code stack that's been going through. Uh, but more than that, I can look into the variables uh, that's in scope. So I can introspect what this has at this very moment. This has hello world service. We have the endpoint set to hello, right? And uh, we have the name. That's the variable here uh, in scope. And that is Ray, and so on and so forth. Um, you can use this tool very easily to kind of figure out what is actually happening in the code without stopping the world. Okay? So a combination of uh, ability to add new logs and also introspect uh, the running code stack uh, really helps people to uh, debug a production system, uh, especially when you have so many instances of microservices. Uh, one of the questions I get is, well, can I isolate, uh, for example, uh, this log to only certain requests? And, and the answer is actually yes. You can actually put in a condition here. So we have conditionals. What that means is if you have session or some kind of request ID in scope, uh, you can actually just isolate the condition to that particular ID. And that helps you narrow down of what you are actually troubleshooting at. Okay. So with that being said, um, I know we covered quite a bit of things. I just want to do a quick recap before we, uh, before we end the session. Uh, so in addition to all the Kubernetes uh, like out-of-the-box command lines, in addition to the aggregation tools, uh, just remember there are other tools that you can use for tracing. Uh, for example, Zipkin that you need to have the visibility into your code stacks across network boundaries. Um, and on Google Cloud, we also have side of a trace. And you can run a Zipkin proxy that automatically forwards Zipkin data to side of a trace so you can take advantage of a hosted service. Uh, in addition to the trace uh, stack that we can see, uh, here's another thing that's really cool. We can automatically generate latency distribution. And in addition to that, we can also automatically generate degradation report. What that means is if you deploy a service today and it slows down the overall latency, uh, we will be able to detect it. And we can actually generate that information and notify you automatically to tell you that there was a degradation in certain uh, of your services, basically. Um, we have a production debugger that you can potentially use. And again, this debugger can work even outside of Google Cloud Platform as well. And um, it's quite useful. You can keep it running the whole time. All you need to do is to by adding a, a Java agent in this case. OK? And um, that's pretty much it. Uh, everything that I showed today, uh, the source code is actually on my GitHub. You can check it out. At uh, on my GitHub, Satanism slash Spring Boot Docker. You can learn more about StackDriver as well on cloudgoogle.com, StackDriver. And um, you can you know, learn more about Artifactory as well uh, from JFrog. And um, that's all I have. And thank you very much for the time. And I think my time is up. So, Simon, I'm going to come back to you and uh, stop the sharing.
Awesome. Thank you very, very much, Ray. Um, always a always a good session with you, and you we were guaranteed one, so thank you very much. Uh, yeah. So let's see if we have any questions. Uh, so we're going to go to uh, Go Java first, and then I'll see if there's anything in um, in Slack after that. So uh, heading over to Brazil. Hello. We are, hey. we, are, we are just translating the, the the presentation. Thank you, Ray. No, oh, thank you. Thanks for uh, translating as well. I appreciate it. <laughs> Hopefully, uh, it was able to uh, to to catch up as well. Um, yeah. So, thank you again for hosting there. Okay. So, let me see if we have any questions in the live session. There's actually, a, 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 another conversation that's happening, which is quite interesting in the in the uh, in the live session channel. I can't see any questions. Can't see any questions in there right now. So, uh, so yeah, I think. Oh no, we have someone typing, so we'll have a question here shortly. Maybe. I got a question in your meetup page asking about A-B testing in Google Cloud Platform. Mm. I see. Um, so typically, A-B testing is at the application level. And um, you can A-B test, of course. But uh, we do not collect, uh, we we're not able to you know, produce uh, meaningful metrics for your A-B test. However, uh, if you want to see the latency distribution uh, or you know, trace between the different uh, application versions, you can certainly do that. You can uh, you know, produce a report, and you can compare the report between the two versions if you like to. Uh, in Kubernetes, for example, it's, very, uh, it's uh, pretty easy to deploy uh, multiple versions or two versions of your application uh, simultaneously and being served through the load balancer so that uh, you can A-B test or canary uh, two or more versions uh, if you want to, basically. Uh, but your application may have to record your own A-B testing uh, data for your business purposes. Um, because the, the data that we are able to capture if you forward the data to, uh, say, trace, is only latency. Uh, and from there, you can only deduce uh, latency uh, distributions. Okay. Does that help? Sure, I answered it. Thank you. Yeah, welcome. OK, so the other question uh, is not a question about this session. So <laughs> <Okay. laughs> you're, welcome to, you're welcome to answer if you want, but I don't think. I don't think well, but I'm not in San Jose. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that's fine. That's fine. Um, oh, oh, wrong, 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 uh, wrong thing. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, actually, I, uh, so uh, I actually I actually completely agree with Jonathan Ross here as well. Uh, so Jonathan says that uh, Ray caught the failed demo so well that it was hard to know how much of this was planned. And uh, I, I actually think, do you know what? I, this entire demo, this everything that happened today was entirely planned, right? Yeah, it's pretty much. I mean, yeah. um, how do how else do you troubleshoot something without a failure? Yeah, uh, yeah. So it so happened I had a bug in my application that I wrote. Really, I mean, I, I use this application for other things, uh, and uh, I thought, huh, I wonder if there's a bug in it. And sure enough, there was a bug, and it was really easy to find. Uh, actually, uh, somebody else found the bug that I didn't even know about, and rather than fixing it, I thought, huh, maybe I can use it to, uh, you know, to do a, a little demo for troubleshooting, and that worked nice. out pretty well. <laughs> nice. uh, also, just to uh, just to uh, I, I realized we actually shared a private joke with uh, did anyone say Kubernetes? But uh, I didn't actually ever dis uh, uh, explain that joke. 
there's a uh, there's a, a Java one keynote uh, community keynote which we were involved with, and uh, yeah. it was it was a really good fun keynote, and Ray did this awesome uh, hybrid cloud demo with uh, with Blue Mix, Oracle Cloud, and of course uh, Google Cloud. And uh, someone mentioned Kubernetes, and Ray walks on stage and said, "Did anyone say Kubernetes?" And it was an <laughs> awesome moment. And uh, ever since then, whenever I see Ray, I have to say that. So uh, yeah, yeah, awesome. Well, too bad I don't, I don't have a Kubernetes shirt on today. Yeah, <laughs> no <worries. laughs> yeah. Cool. Awesome. So, uh, so with that, um, I think we'll say a big thank you very much to Ray, and also for, to, to to Google, of course, who have um, who have. Uh, uh, been sponsoring uh, the Job Twenty Four for two years now, uh, so so that was that was super cool as well to have their support. And while I'm talking, actually, we do have a question in, so we can take that question now uh, from Sermo John. Uh, what is the overhead of keeping the method stack instance data per breakpoint for your production environments, and is this performed on different containers? Gotcha. So um, if you set a uh, one of those, uh, well, it's not a breakpoint because it doesn't actually stop the app. But the, once the snapshot is taken, that is taken out of, um, it doesn't take another one, basically. So the first one that matches the condition uh, will trigger the snapshot to be taken. And, um, and that's pretty much it, right? And all of these things are actually stored uh, you know, on the cloud as well. So the, uh, the data is forwarded to the cloud. Uh, that's why you can see that data in the console. Uh, so there is very minimal overhead so uh, it's not it, it's not constant overhead pretty much it's just a when yeah. something happens kind of overhead yeah exactly when when you yeah exactly um, in which case you don't particularly care about the overhead at all right you've got bigger problems that right yeah and even if you turn around the overhead is fairly minimal yeah. um in addition to what i showed today is uh you know doing the, the both the log and the, the snapshot directly on the, the web interface you can actually use intellij install a Google Cloud plugin. So without going to the web console, you can just, you know, in your own IDE, you can attach a debugger on your running application instance, assuming the agent is running there. Uh, and from there, once you attach the debugger, we will uh, check out the code from the right revision. So we are not debugging the wrong version of the code. And from your IDE, you can also set up a snapshot. Uh, and from there, whenever somebody goes through that line of code that matches the condition, uh, your IDE get notified, and you can actually see the code stack as well. Mm -hmm. OK. Yep. Um, so yeah, I think that's pretty much all questions then. So okay. um, right, massive thank you for supporting the virtual jug again. Always a pleasure to have you on. Yep. And uh, congratulations on your recent um, uh, vjuggernaut award. Oh, really? Did you get one yeah. this year? Oh, was it last year you got had one? Well, I, I don't remember. <laughs> oh, okay. Right. I, yeah. I'm getting confused. Well, hopefully, it's, hopefully it's, it's getting it's getting late on VJug, isn't it? That's I know. Yeah. Late. I'm sure <laughs> it'll happen. <laughs> yeah. No problem. Yeah. Uh, okay. So uh, our next session is uh, Audrey Navo. Uh, the end of polling. Why and how to transform a REST API into a data streaming API. Um, so that'll be happening in just over five minutes. So we'll take a we'll take a short break for five minutes. Wow, Ray, where's that? You're in New uh, York. And that's New York from our office, yeah. Uh, that's a big cool. show. Yeah. Nice, 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 nice. Must be yeah. nice to be home, though. Yeah, it's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So we'll take a five minute break there. Um, and uh, we'll start again with Audrey in five. Thanks very much, Ray. And thank you to uh, Go Java as well. Cheers, thank you, Simon. Thank you.